I would like to welcome Superintendent Joe and my principal, Miss Terry, and Miss Abby, who I would like to welcome last. Last is everyone who's watching and who joined us today. Why we're here today is to introduce offer Kalia Yang. Hi. I would like to introduce her latest book titled The Most Beautiful Things. I read this book with my grandma before and I love it so much. I live with my grandma and my mom, just like in the story. And yes, there are lots of beautiful things. I go outside, me and my grandma go outside and look up at the clouds. And sometimes I see dogs and butterflies. And sometimes my grandma sees these cats, butterflies, bees. And yeah. Thanks for watching. Bye. I hope you like this. So bye. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, Faith. That was such a beautiful job. And yes, indeed, what a beautiful thing. Welcome, everybody. My name is Terry Jackson, um, known as Miss Terry in the Nokomis community. I am the principal at Nokomis Montessori North. We, um, this is a really special day, and we want to take this opportunity to say thank you so much for all of you that are joining us. Um, happy New Year, Happy Hmong New Year, Na Zhang Zhang Chia, and um, thank you so much to our special author, um, Ms. Kalkalia Yang, for sharing this most incredible, beautiful book that has inspired so many of us um, in terms of the connections, the rich relationships, the perspective of beautiful things in our students and staff and community everywhere that have shared their connections in the traditions and celebrations from within. So we are honored and so privileged here um, to be part of this wonderful event. This is Abby. Good morning and welcome everybody. I'm Miss Abby Felber-Smith and I'm principal at Nokomis Montessori South. Over the past several weeks, our staff, students, and families have enjoyed reading and discussing the most beautiful thing by local author Kao Kalia Yang. We are so excited to have her with us today. Our students very much enjoy Ms. Kalkalia's beautiful stories and are inspired to think more deeply about both storytelling and the writing process because of them. This morning, we will hear the story, the most beautiful thing in Ms. Kalkalia's words. We then have a series of questions from our very own Nakoma students. We hope you enjoy. Before we get started, um, I would like to also welcome some special guests that we have with us today, um, along with our staff, students, and community. I would like to first introduce our superintendent of St. Paul Public Schools, Dr. Gathard. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you so much. It is. Just had to make sure I was off mute. Good morning, everyone. It is so great to be here today with our St. Paul Public Schools community and especially our Nokomis North and South campuses. Uh, it is wonderful to, to know that you're gathering today to celebrate uh, both uh, a happy Hmong New Year and also our St. Paul Public Schools alumni, Ms. Kao Kalia Yang, who's gonna read aloud her book today. Ms. Kalia is a generous partner, as an author, speaker, and just a great friend to our St. Paul Public Schools students, all of you, and to our families. We value culturally relevant stories, personal narratives that are that are inclusive of all the stories in St. Paul. And Miss Kalia's story is wonderful. You know, when I spent time with her last year uh, when she read her previous book um, at Nokomis, 
I could feel how much our community, how much it meant to our community to come together uh, to hear stories from one of our own about many of the, the family stories that each of you share uh, together in, in such a special way. So we are honored to have Ms. Kalia with us today and, and certainly proud of her continued success as an author. I'd also like to introduce Commissioner Mary Catherine Ricker, a longtime St. Paul Public Schools community member, uh, as a former teacher, and is now the Minnesota Department of Education Commissioner. So Commissioner Ricker, I will turn it over to you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much, Superintendent Gothard. It is just such an incredible honor to be invited to be here today. Um, as a teacher in St. Paul Public Schools, I had the opportunity to bring an author to meet my students as well. And the opportunity for students to see where their writing could take them um, and and to see uh, be, be a part of this uh, activity this opportunity today uh, with one of our St. Paul Public School graduates, Kao Kalia Lang, an accomplished writer. Um, I am so excited and I am so privileged to be able to be here. And, and I wanna say happy Hmong New Year to everyone as well. Thank you so much for letting me be part of this special presentation. And I could not ask for a better launch than Faith's incredible reflection on this book and what it meant to her in, in both her education and to her family. Uh, Faith, that was an incredible introduction um, to launch the day and I want to thank you and I look forward to where your writing and reflection takes you as well as a student and as a fellow community member here in St. Paul. Celebrating students and parents and families and educators convening in a space like this, even as it's virtual to celebrate books is just an incredible, exciting opportunity for me. Being able to listen to Kalkalia Yang's story about growing up in a family that shares some of the same struggles our families are experiencing today, some of the same reflections our families are having today. The most beautiful thing reminds us of what matters most that special people in our lives and taking time to care for one another. So taking time to be with all of you today means a lot to me and feels like the spirit of the most beautiful thing. And I am so excited to listen along with you. And it is now my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Ming Ma. And he has prepared a very warm welcome for our author today, Kao Kalia Yang. Thank you to all the Nakoma students who have contributed to this program. Uh, your progress means the world to me, and it is an absolute privilege to be with all of you today. Thank you so much. I am in first grade. Something about me is that I like to play with my dog Spirit because he is a cute dog. I am excited to introduce our our for I am excited to introduce to Kao Kalia She is a famous author for reading grown up books and children's books. Who lives in here in Minnesota? Last time, last year she came to the comments and she read the map into the world. I'm sorry I missed it. Today, Kao Kalia will read the, the most beautiful thing. Please Let's welcome Kao Kalia Ying with our claps. Thank you. 
Good job. Is Cal Kalia a writer? Yep. Awesome. Do you like reading her books? Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Ming Mong. That was such a beautiful job. And without any further ado, we um, it is my greatest um, honor to introduce you to Ms. Kalkalia's book, The Most Beautiful Thing. The Most Beautiful Thing by Kalkalia Yang, illustrated by Kwa Le. Dedication. For the everlasting beauty of a grandmother's smile, for Zhuo Li, the grandma in this book, and Zhuo Ta, the grandma I never got to meet, but whose love shines through my mother. Kwa's dedication. A grandma who forgot everything, but will never be forgotten. The most beautiful thing. My grandmother is so old that no one knows how old she is. Not me, not my big sister Dove, not our older cousin Lei. My father waits patiently when we try to guess her age. He is my grandma's ninth and youngest child, and even he does not know how old she is. We know that my grandma was born on the other side of the world, across a wide ocean. My grandma came from a time and a place where creatures lurked in the jungles, waiting to chase unwary children. She told us that she once looked into the gleaming eyes of a tiger and felt its hot breath on her face. By the time I was born, my grandmother already had an old woman's face. Her skin was soft but dry like paper, and in her mouth was a single tooth. Grandma said, It is the only thing standing strong in my mouth, the spinal tooth that my mother and father gave me. I asked to see a picture of her parents. She said, May I, they lived in a time long before the Hmong learned of such things as photographs. She pointed to her heart. The only picture I have of them is here. The luckiest of the grandchildren got to help take care of grandma. Lei got to wash grandma's clothes by hand at the bathroom sink with sweet smelling pink soap. Dad got to wash grandma's soft brown back in the bathtub with a soapy cloth. And me? I got to clip her fingernails and toenails while grandma sat on her favorite stool in the light from the window. I can still feel the roughness of grandma's heels in my hand, the thickness of her toenails in between my fingers. I can see the bottoms of her feet, thick and brown and broken, deep cracks filled with dirt from long ago and far away. Grandma told me that her mother and father died when she was a little girl. Grandma was just a child herself, but she had to take care of her two younger brothers and their baby sister. I looked up at my grandma from the place where I sat at her feet and I asked her, how did you get food for them? Grandma said, I didn't find enough food. We lived always with hunger eating us on the inside. All my life with her, even with just her one tooth, grandma never said no when we offered her something to eat. The ice cream truck was singing its song from down the street. I looked underneath the couch for quarters. There were none. So I got ice cubes from the freezer. I offer one to grandma in my red plastic cup. She smiled at me. When I wanted a new dress to wear on the first day of third grade, my mother said she did not have enough money. She found some nickels and a dime in her purse and offered them to me. I bought hard peppermint candies from the neighborhood grocery store at the corner of our block. When I got home, I offered one to grandma on the palm of my hand. She smiled at me. At the round table with its shaky legs, I used my spoon to mix and mix in the corner soup bowl we all shared. There were no pieces of meat, only bones and soft greens. My father said, the price of meat is too expensive at the market, may I? I found a thick chunk of bone and offered it to grandma on my spoon. She smiled at me. We had plenty of meat only when we celebrated Hmong New Year with our aunts, uncles, and cousins. The old table was heavy with whole boiled chicken, more than our family could ever eat. 
After dinner, our bellies full, my cousins and I sat on the carpet around Grandma as she told us stories. She always began. It was a long time ago, and I was just a girl. As we listened, our eyes grew round. Grandma twisted her fingers one over the other to show us what the hands of Bunzong, jungle spirits the size of children, looked like. She taught us how to listen to the cries of the fearsome pain nearby by holding our breath until our hearts pounded in our ears. We were always sad when Aunt Chu called. Time for the children to help clean up. On a cold day when the snow blew onto the window panes and the light was dim, I asked Grandma about the dirt in her feet. She told me she didn't have shoes after her mother and father died. She went shoeless to the mountains to tend to the family field. She ventured into the jungle to look for wild roots, bamboo shoots, and edible mushrooms. And one day, she was chased by a tiger. As she fled, her bare feet broke open on the fallen branches, and she still ran, blood and dirt mixing into clay with each step. I squeezed her feet in my arms and pulled them close to my heart, a hug for the hard road she's walked to get to me. Each year cutting my grandma's nails went faster because I grew stronger and bigger and more able. Each year grandma's feet felt smaller and smaller in my hands and my lap. Her stories too slowed with the passing years. The pauses between her words grew long. Sometimes as grandma was looking for the words she lost to the years, I grew distracted from my task. Looking at the toys on the floor that needed to be picked up, the unfinished schoolwork, the younger children who needed to be bathed. Her deep, even breathing would call me back to the moment, only to find her eyes closed in sleep, one hand raised against the window to cradle her head. I grew unhappy with our life. I was tired of getting ice cubes from the freezer when I wanted ice cream. I was tired of never getting the new dress for the first day of school. I was tired of gnawing on the bone in the soup when I wanted meat for myself and my grandma. One evening, I studied my face in the bathroom mirror, wishing my teeth were straight. I came out of the bathroom and said, Mom and Dad, I want braces. Can I have them? My mother looked up from nursing my baby sister and said, We don't have any money. Maybe next year? My father looked up from my toddler sister. He was bouncing on his legs and said, I wish we could get you braces, Minai, but we can't right now. My grandmother looked up from her special stool by the big window. Galia, she said, look at me. I turned to her in the glow of early evening. The sun was low in the sky and its golden light fell on her face. Grandma asked, is my smile not beautiful? In that moment, I could see all the times my grandmother had smiled at me. I could taste the cold ice cubes that melted summer's heat from our tongues, the sweetness of the hard peppermint candies, and the deep flavors of the bone broth in the bowls of boiled greens. Even now, I can still see my grandma's single tooth white against the shadows, standing tall in her open mouth. Her smile was the most beautiful thing. Hello, St. Paul's Public Schools. Thank you for having me. My name is Kao Kalia Yang, and I'm a graduate, as the superintendent said, of the St. Paul Public Schools. Every time I have an opportunity to return, it feels like I'm returning home to a piece of the home that I carry with me everywhere I go, as an adult, as a writer, as a storyteller. Today is a beautiful day. The sky is blue, the air is clear. It is Hmong New Year, It is a season when we let go of the old year and we embrace the new, where we gather our thanks and those we love close, and we celebrate this journey that we share, this journey of life. I'm so very happy to introduce the most beautiful thing to the St. Paul Public School community today. It is a story that happened while I was a child in these schools. It is a story that I carry with me to remind me 
of all of the things that money cannot buy. I think particularly at this moment, in the middle of a pandemic, when so many families are apart, when so many families have to do, have to make do with so very little, it is particularly important that we hold fast to the things that money cannot buy. I understand that the Nokomis communities um, have questions for me, that the students have questions for me. I would do my very best with them, my very best. Because that is the gift that we give to each other every single day when we journey into the landscape of learning together. So please, we can play the very first video. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Ms. Kalia. Um, yes, we are thrilled to hear some questions from our very own uh, SPPS students. Um, we will start with Savannah, a fourth grader at Nokomis Montessori South. Dedication for the everlasting. Hi, Ms. Kalia. My name is Savannah and I am in fourth grade. My question for you is that all the stories that your grandma told you is it all true? My grandma and your grandma are connected by having only one tooth. My grandma has to use fake teeth so she could chew, eat, and talk. Thank you. Thank you, Savannah, for that lovely question. You know, I believed every story that my grandma told me even the ones that I, I thought were magical and incredible because I understood that they were her gifts for me. I grew up in a family where we didn't have a lot of things to give to each other. It was oftentimes our words that were our gifts. And my grandma showered me with gifts and I received them, her stories like they were gifts. You know, so many St. Paul public school students read um, like the emperor's clothes, right? My grandma's stories in many ways are, are they're, they're like my warrior, you know, my warrior clothes into the world. Yes, today I have on a black shirt, but really I'm armed with the gift of my grandma's stories as well. And so I totally believed them, every single one, and I cherish them still. Thank you. Our next question is also from a Nakoma South fourth grader. I'm happy to introduce Kalna. My name is Anna. I am in fourth grade and nine years old. This story reminded me about my dad because my dad was separated from my grandfather when he was nine because there was a war. So he went to a different city in Ethiopia called Miguela. And yeah, my question is, you know, about your grandmother. How come your grandmother um, didn't get adopted or raised by anybody? Thank you, Thank you. for sharing your family's own story of running away from a war, of escaping a war. I'm so happy that we, um, we can share these stories with each other because they're so important to all of us. No, my grandma, so she lived in long ago Laos in a tiny village. When her parents died, she moved into the house of, a, of, a, of an uncle. But food was very hard to come by. There were many children and few adults, many, many mouths to feed. So often it fell upon my grandma to find food for herself and her siblings, to contribute to the bigger family that they were living with, but also to take care of her younger brothers and sisters. You know, when I was growing up, my grandma told me about how the baby, only seven months old, her baby sister, how she couldn't fall asleep at night and she would cry and cry. And my grandma said my grandma would cry with her. She would carry the baby on her back with a Hmong baby carrying cloth and they would walk along the edge of the fire ring and my grandma would cry with her. She said that happened for years until the tears stopped. And then grandma started singing to the baby. So they were partially adopted um, the best that the family could do for each other then. Thank you.
Thank you so much, um, um, Ms. Kalia. Um, the next fabulous duo that I am going to introduce um, are going to share some of their beautiful and rich connections. Um, Ms. Ching is um, not only a um, wonderful teacher at Nokomis Montessori, but her siblings are also, and along with Ms. Ching, are also all graduates of St. Paul Public Schools as well. And right next to her, her daughter, her oldest daughter, Lily, is um, one of our students at Nokomis North. And they want to share some of their connections and questions for you as well. Hi, I'm Hi, my name's Lily. We really enjoy the book. Um, we were able to make lots of connections to this story. From the Takaukalea, I grew up with my grandma. I lived in intergenerational homes. That means I lived with my grandparents, my parents, my brothers, and sisters, just like Kaukalea did in her story. This is a common practice for Hmong families that the youngest son lives with the parents. And that's what I experienced as a child growing up. Um, when I was a child, I remember we didn't have much. My mom passed away when I was two years old, so my grandma had to take care of my siblings and I while my dad had to go to work. I also remember that it was hard growing up as a child because of being different. I was Hmong, I looked different from my classmates. I even spoke different English from my classmates. I um, didn't speak English at home. My parents didn't teach me English, so I had to learn English at school. And the way I spoke was different, and it and it made me feel like I didn't belong. Um, also, the way I dressed was a little bit different from my classmates. And I always remember telling my grandma about how I felt, how I looked different, I spoke differently, and I even looked different from my classmates. And I, and I always remember that my grandma made me feel better, no matter how hard it was. So we are still so blessed to still have grandma in our lives. Um, I feel like we were being protected and still being protected by her love and her strength. She is 100 years old um, this month. So we are so happy to have, we're so happy to have grandma around still. So Kalkalia, thank you uh, for this book to remind us that love is truly the most beautiful thing. So we have a question for Kalkalia. Do you remember what the question is? No? Remember, it's how long did it take you to write the book? Can you say that? How long did it take you to write the book? So how long did it take you to write the book? Um, so how was the process of putting all your thoughts together on paper? And then when you were done writing it, how long did it take you to publish your story? Thank you. Hello, Ching. Thank you for sharing so very much. Um, first and foremost, though, I want to say a very happy birthday to your grandma. It is a gift to have our elders in our lives. And um, yours is a gift that has traveled through much of time. So happy birthday to your grandma. You know, I remember being um, a young girl and wishing, wanting desperately to be normal, to have you know, the kind of puffy jackets that were very popular when I was young. I wanted one. I wanted to have, you know, glittery shoes like so many of the um, the wealthier girls in my, in my school. But I remember one day my father taking me aside and saying to me very seriously, very calmly, you know, the things that make you different, these will be your gifts to the world. And I listened to him. And it's taken me a long time to realize the truth of those words. You know, all these stories that I tell, the choir that lives inside of me, these are my gifts to the world. My ability to listen, all the things that I do not have, all of the things that I've created in the empty spaces in my life, these are my gifts to the world. How long did it take me to write the most beautiful thing? And I should say this, for a lot of writers, including this one, um, this one. You know, a lot of the stories that I'm telling are stories that I've been carrying with me for a long, long time. And so I knew that there was a story that I wanted to tell about my grandma's singular tooth, this last gift that her mom and dad had, give, that had left for her, had given her. 
You know, I knew that that's what I wanted to write about. And when I started thinking seriously about it, I also thought about the tiger that she outran to, to, to get to me. You know, I, I thought about my grandma with her torn earlobe, you know, that she, she was never able to wear jewelry. Um, the things that made her beautiful were not the decorations that she put on herself. It was something else. And so this was the heart of the story. It took me a whole month of trying different ways to think about it. And then it took me a year and some working with a fantastic editor named Carol Hins from Learner Books to flush out the story and to make sure that the rhythm and the flow and that I was choosing the best possible words to do justice to my grandma's story. And then it took more time even for Kwa to do her illustrations and for the visual team, the art department at the, at the press to come together to decide where the words are going to go on the page. Children's books are team efforts. You have to be willing and ready to work with a team to express your ideas and hear the ideas of others and really to inspire each other along the journey. And so me, maybe a month for that first draft, all of us about two years to put this book together. It is a long time in the coming, but it has lived in my heart for even longer than that. And I think my readers feel it when they read the book. So it's really a gift that I have carried this story so so long and that it is now traveling and I hope traveling so far. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next we have Javier from Nakoma South and Javier poses a question and share some thoughtful connections um, between the story and his experience. Oop. Okay. Hi, Ms. Julia. My name is Javier, and I'm in fourth grade. I have a question about your story, and I can relate to your story because I have a grandmother who comes and visits the United States, and we get to spend a lot of time together. She's from El Salvador. She told me how much my work, how much she works to get enough money to buy stuff. My question is, what made you write the story? And my connection is that. Me, every, like me and my grandma always spend a lot of time together. Thank, Thank you. you for your question. Thank you. Next Thank time you. Your comes, I hope you remember to say hello to her for me from, from a writer who also um, loved her grandma very much. And I said grandma because one of my grandmas I never got to meet. Um, she, my mother left her because of the war in Laos and my mother was never able to meet up with her. She died when we were in America, so I've never gotten to meet her. But everybody says I look just like her. So that's a gift that I carry from her. And I think that is really the reason why I wrote this book. There were so many gifts in my life that when I was younger, when I was your age, I didn't see as gifts. The fact that I had teeth at all is a gift, but when I was younger, I didn't like my teeth. And even now, I don't love it still, but I understand that it is a gift. And my goal now as an adult is to make sure that the set of teeth lasts me as long as possible. You know, it's, it's this effort to hold on to the things that we've inherited, the people that we come from, the people that we will give birth to. I, I'm a mother. I have three little kids, a daughter who's seven, and I have twins who are five. And I know that I'm not able to give them everything my heart desires. And I don't know if I've given them everything that they will want physically, but I've given them everything I have. And that has to be enough. It was enough for me and it will be enough for them. But that reminder is necessary in the life of all, all human beings, young and old. And so I wrote this book in an effort to remind myself and the world of the tremendous love and the tremendous beauty that we've inherited how it is our responsibility to care for these things and do our very best by them. I appreciate your question very much. All right, now we have Mendy and Wendy, fifth graders from Nakoma South, and they bring a, a list of questions for you. Hi, Ms. Paula. 
My name is Nandi and I'm 10 years old. And I'm here to give you questions um, about your book called The Most Beautiful Thing. Um, my name is Wendy and I'm 10 years old. My first question is, are you still guessing about your grandma's age? Um, my question is, how long did it take you to make that book? And my second question is, compared to yours when you wanted pieces and I wanted a necklace and my mom, my parents said it was too expensive for us to buy. So, okay. My second question is, how old was your grandma when uh, she told you the story? But I'm not sure if you uh, don't know her age yet. The third question is, um, how long did it take you to make that book? Um, 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 I don't remember my, uh, you can send that to me. Ah, that's all I have. Oh, okay. Um, uh, did your house fit all you? Oh, um, yes, I think so. Oh, wait, I think I have one more. And my first question is, um, where did you guys live when you guys were really young? Because I think you guys lived in Thailand. Because Thailand has a jungle and lions. And yeah, it's been cool. Um, thank you for answering our questions, and we really love your books, finally. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you, you for your lovely, lovely questions. Um, and I, I, I should say, you know, as they were talking, I was taking down notes because I, I heard the list and I knew I would be able to remember them all. So I took notes, and that's something that a lot of writers do. When we something great happens or something hurts our hearts, we sometimes take notes, you know, and these notes become the stories of the future. And so I took notes. Um, you know, I have a soft spot for twins. I have I have twin sons. And so thank you. Um, the first question, are you still um, are you still guessing your grandma's age? I don't anymore. For a long time when I was younger, it was important to me. But now. It was enough that I was born to an old woman and that I grew up loving one, you know? So I don't guess her age anymore. It's, it, I think it's a tremendous, um, she's a hero because she got to be old in a country, in a world at a time when so many people didn't. Um, how, old, how, how did I write the book? You know, I wrote it, I took notes on paper just like I did right now, and then I typed it up and kept on typing it up because the editorial process is important. Even for an experienced writer like me, sometimes the first draft just isn't going to cut it. In fact, sometimes the 10th draft isn't even going to cut it. And so a lot of revision went into the, this, the writing of this book. Um, I thank you for sharing the story about, about how you wanted a necklace just as how I wanted braces, you know? My, grand, my, my mother said something really important to me when I didn't get something I really wanted. She said to me that I was gonna be made by the things that I, the, the opportunities that I was denied, just as I would be made by the opportunities that I was given. And I live with those words very close to me. Even as an adult, there are many things I want that I will probably likely never get, you know? And I think they make me a better human being a more humble, thoughtful human being, a human being who looks for meaning in places where other people might forget to look or forget to see. Um, so how old was grandma when she told me the story? You know, my grandma was many different ages when she told me the stories. My life with her, she told me stories again and again, and sometimes near the end, they were the same stories. And so it's like a record in my head. I close my eyes and I can still hear my grandmother telling me the stories from across all of the, all of the years we had together. One of my favorite soundtracks of all. Um, how long did it take me to write the book? I, I, I um, responded to that earlier with Javier. 
and, and others. So I'll, I will skip that question. Um, well, but I love this one. Was our house big enough to hold all of us? You know, in the moan, we have a saying, the house may not be big, but the heart is immense. So I never felt like the house was too small. And I don't feel it now in all of the spaces where I go. I'm never looking to make spaces bigger. I'm always looking to open up this heart wider. And I, I like living that way. And I like thinking that way. Not only is it creative, but it means that the house is always, always big enough. We just have to be creative sometimes to make it possible. Um, where did we live when I was younger? You're absolutely right. I was born in Thailand and I lived for six years in Thailand. My older sister, you know, lived for longer in Thailand because she was born before me. But most of my life, I've lived on the east side of St. Paul, where I am speaking to you from today. I moved back to the very same part of the city that raised me. So the east side of St. Paul is my home. And I'm very proud of this fact. I carry it with me everywhere I go in the world, everywhere I go in my work as a, as a writer. Thank you. I hope I tackle most of your questions. I think you did. I think I think you got them all. Um, we have one more video question and then a few written in questions. Um, so the last video is from a fifth grader at Nakoma South Akina. This is the questions and the connections for um, the most beautiful thing. What is what motivated you to making to make this book? And the connection is my mom told me um, when she was younger they only had they had to use one bowl to eat out of like one bowl for the whole family. Thank you, Thank you for your for your thoughtful question and your thoughtful connection. You know, about three years ago, I returned to Laos for the very first time, the place where my grandma was born and where my mom and dad were born. And there were so many meals that I ate with different families and yes, there was only one bowl and everybody had a spoon and we share from the same rice bowl and we share from the same bowls of boiled greens and we share from the same small, small bowl of meat. And in many ways, I understood that that was one way to look at love and to look at family. And so it's something, it's a memory that I hold very close to me, particularly in my life in America. It's a good reminder. Um, what, you know, why did I write this book? I think about this story often. And, you know, the truth is that, uh, the, the question often, and the truth is that every single time I can come up with a different answer. And I think that is why the book was, it was such a gift and opportunity that this book now exists. You know, I wrote the book, believe it or not, for you. Because you go to the St. Paul Public Schools, the very same district that I went to when I was a kid. And in fact, um, the Nokoma schools, my siblings went there. When I was growing up, there were there were no books by Hmong American authors about Hmong, Hmong American families. And in my heart, there was a hunger. There was a hunger. And I thought maybe when I grew up that the hunger would go away. But I was wrong. It grew bigger and bigger and bigger until I knew that if I didn't do something about it, it would eat me up. And so I wrote the book for you so that when you're growing up, as you're growing up, you don't have to live in a world where there are no stories like you, where those connections that are that, that, that hold your life together, where those connections will have to exist in quiet and unknown and undocumented and unwritten forms. So I wrote it as a tool for you to show you what is possible so that one day you will live the stories I never imagined because I, we've pushed the edges of our imaginations together. That's my answer today. That's my answer for you, Akina. Thank you so, so much, Kalia and students. Um, we actually have had several other questions and 
thoughtful connections. And I um, know that many, many more students out there that are sitting in their class meetings this morning on Google Me in their families are watching and thinking and have ideas. What I wanna say to all of you is that we will share some of the questions, but please continue, continue to um, share your seeds, grow your ideas um, and, keep those beautiful ideas from your heart in your head and bring them forth onto paper or audio or however that you can share and express like our, our author had um, told us and, um, and gave us some courage to inspire us to bring those uh, beautiful strength forward. Um, and thank you to all of the teachers and families out there uh, for helping our kids to bring forth their beautiful ideas as well. Um, we have just a couple more that we want to share with you from our students and Miss Abby will go with the first one. Hi, right, thank you. Yes, I agree with Terry. We could be we could be on for days. Our students had so many great questions and, and connections and stories to tell. Um, we had a couple more questions about your grandmother. So I'll, um, Jeremiah, a third grader, asked if you learned good qualities from your grandmother. And AJ, one of our fifth graders, wanted to know a little bit more about why didn't grandma have enough food for the family? Jeremiah, that's a, such a good question. You know, what did I learn from my grandma? She had many good traits. You know, my grandma never rushed. I tend to hurry through most of everything. I have a runner's heart, although I don't have a runner's body. Uh -huh. And so one of the things that I think about when I can feel my heart beating up because I want to run fast and far is, is to remember the image of how my grandmother walked. She walked with a lopsided walk a little bit, but she always stopped. My grandma looked at every plant in her way and she saw it. She didn't just look at it. She saw it. More often than not, she stopped and she touched it. Sometimes she smelled it. Now, my grandma was a great medicine woman and she honored everything in the world. She honored everything as a gift and everything was something to contribute. And so these are traits that I carry in my heart and I try to remember and instill it, you know, in this runner's heart of mine, this fluttering heart of mine. Um, and so that's just one thing that I, I always close my eyes and I see. My grandmother walking away. My grandmother coming toward me slowly. You know, every time she walked toward me, I was never afraid that she wouldn't get here. I believed that that speed of walking would take her to me in good time. And so that's something that I think about often, and I have to, in, in the way that I tend to live and the, in, in my natural instincts. Um, the other question, AJ's question, um, how come my grandmother couldn't find enough food? You know, in Laos and many other countries in the world right now, you eat what you find. You know, there are places in the world and Laos is one of the poorest countries in the world. If we're talking about economics, if we're talking about money, if we're talking about trade, you know, when America bombed Laos, they use a strike bombing pattern. And so instead of just dropping one bomb, you drop clusters of bombs. And part of the idea was it was an experiment but also was that Laos would never be able to rebuild if, if America, if the secret war in Laos didn't go well for the American cause. Um, so now it's even harder to find food than it was. That's my first point. My second point, it was so hard because she was a child because there were tigers in the jungles and she was afraid. And every time she ventured far, she had to look and listen for every danger in her way because she was the oldest and she felt her responsibility to attend to the younger ones. And so as she said it, and as I wrote it in the book, she lived always with hunger, eating her on the inside. And that shaped my grandma forever, you know? Um, every time we gave her food, no matter what it was, she would say yes, because she would understand the heart behind it. I, 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 I know my grandma, you know, she didn't particularly love lollipops. It wasn't her thing. Whenever I offered them, she always said yes, because she knew it was my thing. She knew it was what I had to give. And she knew that I was giving it to her because somehow the hunger that was eating her up on the inside, I felt that too, as her granddaughter. And so, yeah, that's why it was hard. She was so young. 
Um, any other questions? Um, yeah, my heart is just filled with so much emotions, love, gratitude for this. Um, we do have a couple more questions from Nokomis North students. We have Katsu, a third grader, that says, wants to know, how do you pick out the books that you write? And then Christian that says, and how do you feel about the books that you have wrote? Wonderful questions. How do I pick them? The, the, the magical answer, and, and I think the true answer, is that sometimes they pick me. I'm sitting at my laptop and I don't know where I want to go. I'm not sure what, what I'm going to write about. But you know, the wind will blow in a different direction and I'll hear a voice in the wind or a little bird will come and perch on, on this tree that has grown over half of my window. And, and I will be reminded of a moment from a, a time before, a story, a memory, something. And that's where I will start. So I always start where I am and I'm always open to traveling anywhere. And so I let the stories pull me in that way. And I think that is the hardest answer I think for a teacher of writing, because that's what I am to give, that sometimes to find the true stories that you need to, to write, you have to open up your heart and your eyes and your ear so far and so wide that what you think you know is no longer as important as all of the things you don't know, you know? And so I write to discover and I write to find and I write to explore and I write to build homes. For all of the homeless stories, for all of the homeless individuals, the spiritual and the real in my life. So that's a big motivating factor in determining stories. Um, the other question, uh, Terry, can you remind me one more time? And how do you feel about the books that you have written? Hmm. That's, a, that's a wonderful question. So I've written three books for children, A Map into the World. Um, and that was for Bob, my neighbor who loved Ruth. And every single day of my life, I've been thankful since that book came out that I wrote it. Bob died in the early days of the pandemic. And although he was only across the street, that street became an ocean. And it was too dangerous for me to cross that ocean for him. And so I couldn't say goodbye. But Bob, you know, after he passed away, many months after I had this dream, his house was on the market, and in the dream, I saw Bob walk over in his regular blue sweatshirt and blue jeans, walking, you know, with energy toward me, and I stopped, and in the dream, I knew Bob had died, and so I said, Bob, and he said to me, I'm, Kalia, I'm just stopping by. I'm going to do a final walkthrough to make sure that the kids have cleaned up the house and that it is in good shape for the new neighbors that will be coming, and I said to Bob, I said, Bob, I miss you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having shared so many of your stories with me. And Bob gave me a big hug and he said to me in the dream, he said, I'm gone, but the stories will remain. And then I watched Bob walk quickly back into the house to do his final walkthrough. Every single day, I'm thankful that that book came out. And I'm so thankful that it came out with Carol Hins, you know, that she understood why that tiny story of a, of a man you know, who lived across the street and a girl who lived across uh, the, on the other side of the street coming together, why that was so important. My second book, The Shared Room, came out in June. And so it came out in the, again, in the pandemic. It is a story that I, I, I never knew I would write. It's a story, you know, about Jenna, a little girl who I know is connected to the Nokomis community who drowned three years ago. You know, Jenna had told me that when she grew up, she wanted to become a writer not just any writer, but that she wanted to become like this writer. And when I saw in the newspapers that it was Nina who had drowned, I looked to find a book for her family, for her brothers and sisters, her mom and her dad, who I have so much respect for, so much love for, and I couldn't find it. Not a lot of writers write about death, especially the death of children. And so with their permission and their blessing, I wrote that one. And I'm so thankful because I know that in the in the in the range of this world in this country that we live in, children lose children every day, families grieve. Perhaps now at this time, in ways that we've never grieved before, and that grief needs to be reflected in the world that we live in, needs to be respected. And so I'm thankful for that one as well. 
And then there's the most beautiful thing, this brand new book. I think it's so beautiful. Now, one thing about this book that I would say, because I know we're almost out of time, is this. When I hold the book this way, right, you can see here, Grandma is sitting with me telling me a story. But from the past, the little girl that she was peeks out at me. Through my grandmother's stories, I've met that little girl, and I have fallen in love with her. And although my grandma is gone, that little girl continues to befriend the little girl in my heart and the little girl outside those doors in my life. And so thankful is the word I would use for each of these stories that I've written and for the two more that will be coming next year, the Yang warriors in the spring and then in the fall from the very tops of the trees. And I am so excited for all of you to meet those books when they make their way into the world. But I couldn't choose a favorite. It would be like choosing a favorite child or a favorite student or even a favorite season. So thank you. Thank you so, so very much. Like I said earlier, we could go on and on. We had so many great questions. Um, from, from the bottom of my heart, we want to thank you for joining us. Um, this morning. Um, I also want to thank all of our students and families who contributed, who participated this morning, um, and, and came together in this space to share and, and learn together. And then I know Terry has a few um, things to add and coming to end. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In closing, I just want to say, and I want to take this moment to thank all of the educators in the St. Paul Public Schools, but beyond, you know, for doing the hard work of trying to teach us to dream of a future in these hard times for having educated me and for continuing to educate my children. Um, your heart and your heart's work is, uh, is deeply appreciated. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. And yes, to all of our teachers, all of our educators out there, that includes you, mom and dad, who are supporting us. And to all of our learners out there, keep on reading, keep on imagining, keep on thinking and creating. And thank you for all of those beautiful inspirations, Ms. Kalia. We are so incredibly grateful. And to all our students out there, we are so proud of all of you. And we are so proud of the hard work that you are doing and keep learning. Um, before I introduce our um, closer, Dr. Gother, would do you have a few words before we close? Yes, thank you so much. Nicomas Montessori, students, staff, families, Commissioner Ricker, um, and on behalf of our Board of Education, uh, Ms. Kalia, it is an absolute honor to have you representing um, uh, our students as a as a SPPS graduate, as a parent, as a member of the community, the connection you've been able to make from Laos to the east side of St. Paul and to all of our schools is a true gift, um, an absolute gift. And we are working so incredibly hard to make sure that learning is culturally relevant and meaningful to our students. And this is one incredible example. The words in those beautiful illustrations uh, will last the test of time and your story will forever be an important part of anyone who is able to uh, gracefully pick that up. Students, I'd also like to share with you another very important thing I think we all heard today is, is a quote that will stick with me. The home may not be big, but the heart is immense. And as you hear Ms. Kalia share her story with all of us, you could feel her heart, you could feel connected to her. And that is the beauty of reading and learning and being part of a community. Uh, she, is, she has brought that to us in, in such a powerful way today. And for that, we are incredibly grateful. Um, so again, thank you so much, Ms. Kalia. Congratulations. Uh, this is just another excellent example of you sharing your past, your family, um, your hard work with us, and we get to benefit from it. And your story will forever live in the hearts and minds of all who are so fortunate to come across it. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gother. And we, um, thanks to everybody. Now I want to introduce Joseph Nokomis North, our first grader, and he's going to close out this program for us. Thanks to everybody. Hey, everyone, my name is Joseph. I am in first grade in Nokomis School. We want to thank 
calculator, calculator Ying for reading her new book and for her time. We hope you visit us soon. Thank you.